So what I want to kind of unpack today in the first session is what is life in the spirit? Because it is a term that has been probably as misunderstood as the Holy Spirit himself, right? There's a, it, we all come to, to this place with maybe a different type of formation, different background. Some of us may have uh, been walking with the Lord and had this strong relationship. We're just looking for more. Some of us might have been invited by a friend. We're not really sure what we're getting ourselves into, the power and purpose, whatever that means at this conference, at Francis University, whatever that is. We're here. What, what do you got? You know, what does the Lord have? Is there more? What does that look like? And some of you might even be here having come across some charismatic people in your life that just bugged you. They just seem very weird to you, like a little off-putting, like they're just not quite right in the head. And sometimes the Holy Spirit can make it seem like that. But honestly, you know, for, for, for me, I just come back to what Pope Benedict XVI said, that for most people... The Holy Spirit just simply remains the undiscovered member of the Trinity. Like, it's easy for us to think of God as Father, right? And, 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 and we did such a great job this morning with Sarah's talk, kind of unpacking out uh, that idea. And last night, you know, Peter did a great job just kind of saying, like, we approach our Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord, as the Savior. So how do we approach the Holy Spirit? What is life in the Spirit? Maybe you've seen a book on Life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is not a book. Maybe your church has offered a seminar called Life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is not a seminar. It's not a retreat. It's not an eccentric spirituality for those wannabe saints and mystics. I believe that Life in the Spirit, at its heart, is a way of life that God has called us to embrace wholeheartedly. And what do I mean by that? Well, what initiates us all into the life in the Spirit, and your life in the Spirit has already begun. You may not realize it. Your life in the Spirit began the day you were baptized. When we talk about life in the Spirit, baptism is the doorway. It began your life in the Spirit. And through baptism, we are brought into relationship with the Trinity. And the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And when we turn to our catechism... And if you don't have a catechism, this is not a shameless plug because I get no kickback at all. Go buy a catechism before you leave. Go to our bookstore and buy a catechism if you don't own one because it is literally a goldmine of Catholic truth and inspirational teaching. It's not just theology. It's inspirational theology that will move you to deeper conversion as you meditate upon these, uh, these words. And I wanted to share four articles, 1996 through 1999. It talks about what happens in baptism in the life of grace. 1996 says, grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. So when we talk about coming back to the Father, embracing the Father, understanding the Father, that is even God's initiative at work in us. You know, when, when we hear the story of the prodigal son coming back, you know, it was the father's love waiting for that son that drew him back, that, turned, that caused the son to repent and come back to his father. And it's the love of the father that restores him from being lost to being a son again. And it's free and undeserved help. Like, like, and what we need from God is free and undeserved help to live as his children. It's not like God wants to give you the Holy Spirit and a set of tools and say, okay, here's the Holy Spirit. Here's some tools. Figure out how to be a child of God now. What the Holy Spirit wants to do is work in your life in such a way that, that the very essence of who you are becomes realigned to this understanding deep within your heart that you are a child of God, that you belong to the Father. That the Holy Spirit makes that reality alive in each one of us because we begin to start see how we are partakers of the divine nature. And partaking in the divine nature, the fulfillment of our growth in the spirit, becoming more like God, is eternal life. It goes on to say in 1997, it says, by baptism, the Christian part participates in the grace of Christ. He receives the life of the spirit who breathes charity into him and who forms the church. So when we are baptized, we receive life in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit breathes the first gift of the Spirit, which is love, into each one of us. 
the love of the Father. St. Paul realized this when he wrote Romans 5, 5. He says, hope does not disappoint because the Holy Spirit has poured the Father's love into our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit that wants to make everything in our heads as Catholics a lived reality that changes our hearts, our souls, every part of us. In 1998, it goes on to say, this vocation to eternal life is supernatural. It depends entirely on God's gratuitous initiative, for he alone can reveal and give himself. We don't come to this conference to take what is ours. As his children, we have inheritance, but it's all God himself that will reveal and give himself to us through the aid, of the, uh, the aid of the Holy Spirit. It depends entirely on God's gratuitous initiative. Like in our relationship with God, God always has to make the first move. You know, it was God making the first move, sending the angel to Mary. First move, I guess, was conceiving her without sin, preparing her to be the vessel by which salvation would come into the world. But at some point, it also needed an assent of her will. Mary had to say yes. And in the same way, the grace that was poured into your heart in baptism needs a yes, a response. It goes on to say finally in 1999, it says, it is the sanctifying or deifying grace received in baptism that is the source of the work of sanctification. So this grace that we receive in baptism, it deifies us, it makes us like God. We talked a little bit about the garden. Peter talked about this, and I think Sarah mentioned it too, that when Adam and Eve sinned, God promised them if they ate of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. And they did. Yet they were still standing before God, breathing. But what had been given to them in their creation, when Jesus, I mean, when the Father breathed the Holy Spirit into Adam, into this, into this man-shaped pile of dust and becomes a living being, that Holy Spirit that was breathed into him, that was what was lost. That presence of God in the heart died. And the God's work of restoration, of salvation, is restoring us to that likeness, giving us the power to know God's love and to follow him as his children. We are always, we've always remained in God's image, but our likeness, our ability to live like God, to love like God, to serve like God, to be like Jesus, the, the visible image of, of the invisible Father, was severely damaged through sin. We needed Jesus to come, and, and, and the, the, the fulfillment, the completion of his work is Pentecost. And I'll share more about that in a little bit. But in Article 1699 in the, in the, in the Catechism, it says this, life in the Spirit fulfills the vocation of man. The fundamental call on your life, the reason why you're created, will find its fulfillment, fulfillment in what we call life in the Spirit. This life is made up of divine charity and human solidarity. So it's love of God and love of neighbor. Once again, the foundational reality of life in the Spirit is love. I know that when we talk about being Spirit-filled, People have a tendency to want to gravitate towards things like speaking in tongues and putting your hair, hands in the air and just shouting out praise to God or maybe giving words of prophecy or words of knowledge or healing. These are all extraordinary, wonderful signs of God's power and mercy. But the foundation of all that has always been and will always be love. Love of God? How well do we love God? And how well do we love one another? That's what constitutes the depth of life in the Spirit is a response of love. And I'm not going to downplay the extraordinary gifts of the Spirit that the Spirit wants to give us so that we'll be equipped for ministry. But even St. Paul says, look, there's all these amazing gifts, but make love your aim. If we aim for love, everything else that God gives us will be used properly. If we aim for something other than love, we're going to miss the target every time. So this life in the Spirit, it fulfills the vocation of man. So how... Do, how is it then that we seem to be so poorly um, catechized or evangelized or brought to this reality? You know, I, I don't know why. There's a number of reasons. It's not a new problem. If you read the stories of the old, in the Acts of the Apostles, there's a, I think there's a point where one of the apostles goes and they find a group of believers and they say, Has, have you been prayed with to receive the Holy Spirit? And they say, oh, we didn't even hear that there's a, a Holy Spirit. <laughs> so, you know, poor catechesis has been around since the beginning of the church, right? 
But even having great catechesis about, about the Holy Spirit is not the end-all, be-all. Because the, 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 the act of receiving the Holy Spirit is a means to an end, which is union with God, union with the Spirit, union with the Trinity. There was a, a, a rancher in uh, Oklahoma in the late 1930s who had, you know, between half a million and a million heads of cattle, had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of land on which his cattle grazed. He was one of the richest cattlemen in the state of Oklahoma, pro probably one of the richest in the country at the time. But two things converged at the same time that wiped him out. Number one, the Dust Bowl. All the land that his cows grazed upon became wasted with sand, covered in sand, and the vegetation died, so he wasn't able to feed his cows. The second thing that happened was the stock market crash, and the price of beef plummeted. And all that he invested, and all that he had saved, and all that he had built started to crumble before him. He was literally selling his cows for a penny on the dollar, trying to keep what he could. And when he ran out of cows to sell, he started selling off parcels of his land. And, he, and, he, and, and within months, he had lost everything except the house that he lived in and a couple of hundred acres that he had left that his house was on. And one morning, he was sitting at his table with a gun, a loaded gun on the table in front of him, considering whether or not he even wanted to be alive anymore because he had lost it all. He had lost all hope with losing all when he heard a knock on the door, and when he opened the door, there was a handful of college students from the University of Oklahoma who were studying geology. And they had been doing some seismographic studies in his area and said, sir, would you mind if we did some research on your land as well? We, we believe there might be oil around here. Having nothing left to lose, the man said, go ahead, do what you need to do. A week later, they came back and said, we are pretty certain that right underneath your property right here is a huge, a huge oil, we're not sure how big, but it's huge. Would you mind if we uh, brought some equipment in and, and started drilling? He's like, go ahead and do what you need to do. And a couple days later, after they set up the drill and, and started going down, they hit one of the largest oil patches in the continental United States. The man immediately went back to the bank, said, they found oil on my land, lend me this money. They lended him all the money, lent him all the money he needed. He bought back almost all the land that he had lost and set up oil, oil rigs all across and became the richest oil man in the state of Oklahoma. Vastly more wealthy and, 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 and more rich than he had ever been before. And I love this story because it highlights and it illustrates how we as Christians mostly live our lives. We live our lives in a state of spiritual poverty because each one of us, when we were baptized, received a deposit of grace, the power of the Holy Spirit that is in your soul. And the only reason why it's not transforming your life and making you a saint, making you the person God created you to be is because we've never been invited to tap into that and release that power, that grace into our lives. I lived so many years of my life in pop, spiritual poverty. I had rich since my baptism. And some of you coming out of this year of, of COVID have lost a lot. You've lost loved ones. You've lost businesses. You've seen friends lose businesses. You've seen your young people lose hope. Give up on life because what difference does it make? Why bother getting... Uh, it doesn't matter. Everything's going to be taken from you. you know, and, and, and even us, as we stand here, we're like, is God still faithful? Is there still hope for us as a people, as a country, as a church? As we see continual another scandal after another scandal or another church closing down or more contraction, like where's, where's this bright future for the church? Is God still there? And is God still faithful? And God wants to... You know, if, if you're struggling with that, I think the Holy Spirit just wants to come into your life and give you an outpouring of new faith to believe that the Lord who's brought us this far has not abandoned us, but might be calling us just to that greater surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit that we might become all that he created us to be. The Catechism teaches us in Article 260, it says, the ultimate end of the whole divine economy is the entry of God's creatures into the perfect union of the blessed trinity. Like the ultimate end of all that God has done in the world. After creation and all the covenants and Noah and Moses and David and, and the prophets prof 
pointing to Christ. You know, all this was pointing to, to Christ coming into the world. So Christ comes into the world, and, and, and what Christ says is, I want to, I want to cast fire. Yeah, I want you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Like he's talking about something even greater that's coming. It's like, better it's for you to, for me to go, because then I can send you this Holy Spirit. Like, I want you to receive this promise of the Father, this power from on high. I want to restore what was lost in the fall into your soul so that you can once again live as a child of God. All that he's done has been to bring us home, back into union with him. And when we look at what life in the Spirit does, it releases the grace of, the, of that. It says life in the Spirit fulfills the vocation of man. It is made up of God's love, divine charity, and love of neighbor, human solidarity. When we choose the Holy Spirit, when we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, we find something that completes us, makes us who we were made to be, makes us holy, gives us peace and satisfaction deep in the soul. But even more importantly, it says at the end of Article 1699, it says, it is graciously offered as salvation. Graciously just means free, without cost. You don't have to earn it. You just have to ask for it. Come Holy Spirit. And God freely gives his Holy Spirit as a means of our salvation. So our catechism teaches us our salvation hinges on our openness to the Holy Spirit and his power at work in our hearts to sanctify us, to teach us to say no to the world and no to sin and yes to Jesus Christ and yes to his kingdom. That is why we need the Holy Spirit. All the other things that the Holy Spirit gives us are great, but the heart of it is love and salvation, this new life that Jesus died on the cross to give each one of us. We can understand how the Holy Spirit wants in, to work in our lives by looking at the words of Jesus. The, the Spirit's greatest desire is that you love the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus' greatest desire is that you receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the commission of the Son and the Spirit together will save you, will make you be, will restore you to what was lost, and give you the peace, joy, and satisfaction that should come from living as a child of the Father. That's what the Spirit does. Jesus calls him advocate. In John 14, 16, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we were to do a checklist of how well we keep the Lord's commandments on a scale of one to 10, 10 being that we're perfectly in love with God and one being we need a lot, a lot, a lot of help, where would we find on a scale of one to 10 of us following God, loving God by keeping his commandments? It might look pretty brutal, you know, like a, a rude awakening. Like, are we really loving God? Are we really keeping his commandments? He throws that out there, and it can be almost like a conviction, like, I, there's no way I can do this. There's no way I can keep God's commandments. There's no way I can love the Lord the way he deserves. But Jesus doesn't end his thought there. He goes, and he finishes it by saying this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always. Another advocate. The word advocate comes from the Latin word advocatus, which little, literally translates into the one who is called to your side. So Jesus says, look, I want to send you one that I'm calling down from heaven to fill your life, to walk at your side always so that you're never alone. And the reality of our lives, I'm sure at different times during the last year, you felt the sting of isolation from being separated from those that you loved, not being able to reach out and touch those people that mean the most of you in your life, and you felt terribly, terribly isolated and alone. That was the worst part of this pandemic, was the emotional beat up that most people got. But the reality is, is we were never alone. You were never alone. God was with you. Because Jesus says, I'm going to send you another advocate. Jesus was with you as your first advocate. The Holy Spirit was there as you. Well, then why didn't they help me when I was really lonely? It's like, because God is the kind of God, he can't force himself into our lives. This is the way God always is. He respects you and loves you so much that he will not force you to be or do anything, but always waits for us to, to invite him in. 
to stir up what's inside of us already for us to tap into that grace. And you know, the problem with us is because we're fallen creatures and, and, and under the influence of sin is we forget very clearly and very quickly how awesome God truly is. It is have this encounter with God and feel his love and peace. And then when somebody cuts you off in the parking lot as you're leaving church, to swear at them under your breath. And you like you lose everything that God just was working on in your heart for the last hour. You're like, in, in, pew, it's gone. And you're like, God, I am so weak. I am so frail. Is there any hope? And yes, the great hope that we have is that God is always with us. It's not that you're going to figure this out and wake up one day and pull you up by, yourself up by the bootstraps and become a saint. But rather, you're going to re re realize finally how ridiculously fragile you are how unfaithful you can be, how weak your will is when it comes to God, and you will completely surrender to the Holy Spirit, and he will be able then to give you these gifts. You'll be open to receive them. You'll see that God is able to do for you what you could. Testing? Okay, make sure this is working. Jesus goes on to say in John 14, 26, he says, the advocate... The Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. I love this. Everything. That's a good word. Does anyone like an everything bagel? I love an everything bagel with butter, mm, toasted with butter, everything bagel. Everything. But in this case, it's better than an everything bagel. The, the, uh, the Holy Spirit will teach you everything. And Jesus knew the, the, his apostles very well. He had seen their weakness on display over and over again. He knew that Peter would deny. He knew that James and John would fight about who's most important. He knew that, that when the rubber hit the road, they would all run like cowards and disappear in their homes, uh, that, you know, that they would not be able to do much in terms of building the church and renewing the face of the earth on their own. That's why he's promising them before he goes to his passion, guys, look, I'm sending you an advocate. He's going to remind you of my teachings. He's going to teach you everything. You know that great commission, go make disciples of all nations? I know none of you have ever done foreign mission work. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit will teach you everything you need to know. You know how to build a church? No, Jesus, we don't. Don't worry. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. He'll teach you everything. And for you, the Lord knows your weaknesses. He knows your sins. There's nothing hidden from him. You might be able to fool yourself. You may be able to fool your family, your friends, but God sees it all. And guess what? He looks beyond all that. He sees the heart of love that he gave you when he created you, and he loves that heart of love. And he's always on your side. That's what an advocate does. An advocate is someone who defends you, someone who mediates for you, someone who counsels for you. And even like a lawyer, an advocate is somebody who, even when they know you're guilty, will still defend you and be on your side. And God knows we are guilty of so much, but he's always on our side to help us get right, to get back to him. What will, what will the Holy Spirit teach you? Everything. But I'm, I really struggle with loving my family right now. Well, have you ever said, Holy Spirit, teach me how to love my family? Holy Spirit's been waiting for you to pray that prayer. If you struggle with a particular relationship and you've never prayed, Holy Spirit, teach me how to love this person. Because obviously God knows how to love them because God knows how to love everybody. I'm supposed to love like God, but I'm not God. I'm just one of his, I'm his, I'm his child, but I'm still weak. Holy Spirit, do something to me. Teach me how to get there, how to love like you do. It says in Article 221 in the Catechism, it says, St. John goes even further when he affirms that God is love. God's very being is love. By sending his only son and the spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an internal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and, listen to this, he has des destined us to share in that exchange. What? So God is this family of love, it's Father, Son, and, Holy and our destiny is to be an adopted child and part of that family of perfect love. Well, the Holy Spirit will get us there. The Holy Spirit will get us there. He'll teach us how to forgive. He'll teach us how to serve, how to pray. 
He'll how to teach us how to stay pure in an impure world. He'll teach us how to spiritually lead our parishes and our families. He'll teach us how to lead our siblings and our, our own children back to Christ. He'll teach us how to celebrate the Mass more fully alive and tuned into what's happening. He'll teach us how to make a good confession. Everything that you want to know in order to get closer to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, your advocate is there to teach you. We need to enter into this life in the Spirit. We need to foster this life in the Spirit. I love the ocean. I'm not a big fan of the beach, but I love the ocean. My wife loves the beach. When we go to the ocean and we vacation on the ocean, she is, from the sun up to sundown, sitting on a chair on the sand. She brings a, a, a couple of books. She brings a, you know, a couple of towels. She brings an umbrella. Sometimes she's under the umbrella, but most of the time she, she tans really well. Me, I go from you know, white to red in five seconds, and then I'm miserable. So I have to be very judicious about the time I spend at the beach. So I'll go down after I spend half an hour slathering myself with PF, SPF like 4,537 sunscreen. I'll still wear a shirt and a hat. I'll swim in the ocean, you know, for, uh, for 15 minutes, and then I'll go back inside. And I sit on the balcony in the shade and watch the ocean. I just watch it. It's mesmerizing. It's like hypnotic. I, lo I love it even more at night because then I can actually go down and spend an hour just sitting on the beach, you know, or, or I get up early as the sun is rising and watch the sun pop up over the Atlantic. Because we like to go to, to the Outer Banks, right? We like to go to Topsail and we like to go to... Uh, anyone ever vacation at the Outer Banks of North Carolina? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little slice of heaven. Um, some fun facts about the ocean, right? Who likes fun facts about the ocean? All right, here's some trivia. How, how many square miles of ocean are there on the Earth's surface? Square miles. Anyone have a guess? We know that it's 70% of the Earth's surface is ocean, but how many square miles? Answer, 140 million square miles of ocean. It's a lot of ocean. Uh, the deepest part of the ocean, does anyone know what the deepest part of the ocean is? The Mariana Trench. And how far does it go down? Just short of seven miles, about 35, 36,000 feet. That means that, you know, you could go diving straight down. Seven miles deeper, deeper, deeper. After you get to about 2,000 feet, the pressure of the ocean upon your body would feel like you, had had, you were lying on the, on the runway with 50 jumbo jets on your chest. It would kill you. That's the abyss. Once you hit 2,000 feet, you're now at, in the abyss. Almost impossible. You know, for any, it, it is impossible for human life to be sustained down there without the aid of equipment. And scientists, I love, there's a website where you can go and, and it, it lists all the new creatures that they discover in the ocean because they discover new creatures like almost weekly. You're like, well, how could that be? Well, right now they have identified and classified 1.5 million different kinds of life in the ocean, different creatures, right? But on the low end, they estimate there's another 2 million creatures yet to be discovered. On the high end, there are some scientists who say there's probably 50 million different kinds of creatures still to be discovered in our oceans. Isn't that amazing? That there might be 50 million species of undiscovered creature in our oceans. And why are we interested in going to Mars? I've seen pictures of Mars. It's rocks. Oh, look, there's more rocks. Oh, and some dirt. Wow, it looks like the desert. Why don't we just go to the desert and take pictures? You know, like, yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing I, know, I know that Chris is a science space geek, you know, but I think the coolest stuff is coming out of the ocean because they look like aliens and tree, you know, they got tentacles and teeth. I mean, some of these things look vicious, you know, and, and they find them growing by volcanic uh, outshoots where there's the boiling water. There's certain creatures that only live there. The only place in the entire world where you can find this creature is it lives within a three foot radius of a fissure in the ground. That's amazing to me. Of all that life that's in the ocean, 90% of it is two miles below the surface. So two miles below the surface of the ocean is where most of this life exists. Places we could never get on our own. And, then, and the last fun fact I'll share is this, that right now floating around in the ocean in tiny particulate form are about 20 million tons of gold. 
So if you're wondering like, okay, I don't really have a retirement program, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to retire, and you have a sieve and a lot of extra time on your hands, you know, you could sit down on the beach and keep scooping up water, maybe in a thousand years or so you have enough to retire, but 20 million tons out there for whoever has the, the, the can figure out how to get it out of the ocean. And the reason I share this all is because I think there's not a better metaphor for the Holy Spirit than the ocean. The ocean's deep, expansive, it's mysterious, it's teeming with life. Much of this life has yet to be discovered, and it's full of treasure. And there's places that we want to go that are so deep that we can't get there on our own. I mean, that, that, that really is the Holy Spirit for us. You know how much of the ocean we've discovered and explored? 10%. Only 10% of our ocean. I would say we've discovered a lot less of the Holy Spirit than 10%. We're lucky if we've gotten to point, point 10%. There's so much more to God, and, and both Sarah and, and Peter talked about this. There's so much more to God. There's so much more to this life in the Holy Spirit that if we're willing to invest a little, God will give us a tremendous reward for our faith, for our yes, for our openness. He will take us places we've never gone. And right now, 80% of all humans on our planet live on the shore of an ocean, right? 80% of all human life lives on the shore of an ocean. And that's the way most of us live in regard to the Holy Spirit. We love to gaze out at the things of God and say, wow, God, you're so beautiful, you're so amazing. And, and, and the Holy Spirit's like saying, like, dive in. Well, I'm not ready to dive in. Maybe I'll stick my toe in. Yeah, that's nice. Or maybe I'll wade it up to my knees. Ooh, that's nice. And the Holy Spirit's like, come deeper. You're like, oh, the waves are kind of choppy. Don't worry about it. Just come, see, experience, receive. You know, we could spend our entire life swimming in the shallow end of, of, of a beach on the ocean and not become an expert on the ocean. To become an expert on the ocean, you've got to plumb the depths of the ocean. You've got to go deep with the ocean. You've got to study the ocean. You've got to, you, you know, you've got to learn what you can, everything you can about the ocean. And that's the same way with our life in the Spirit. We have to have an informed mind. We have to learn what the church teaches us, what the saints teach us about the Holy Spirit. But more importantly, we've got to dive in. We've got to be open. This life in the Spirit is something that's not meant to be a, the a theoretical concept in our heads an idea or a teaching, but a lived reality. And, it, and it's meant to be a blessing, not just to, for us, but to help make us a blessing to other people. You are meant to be a blessing to other people. It says in John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send from the Father, the spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, he will testify to me which means when the Spirit comes to you, the Spirit will testify in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. How do you get rock-solid faith that Jesus is who he is? You invite the Holy Spirit into your life, and the Holy Spirit himself gives testimony in your soul that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's why P Peter last night said, look, we can't even say Jesus Christ is Lord and mean it without the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't say these words without the power of the Holy Spirit. They won't be the anthem of our life. It's not meant to be just a testimony or, a, or a, a statement of fact. It's meant to be the anthem of our life. Jesus Christ is Lord. But more importantly, be able to say with boldness, Jesus Christ is my Lord. Because he's going to be Lord whether he's your Lord or not. That my, the difference in that word, one word my, means that you've made a significant change in who you are, in the way you orient your life. Is it oriented towards yourself? your self-gratification, the things that you want, your desire, or have you, like Christ, submitted your will to the Father and now everything in you is oriented to Jesus? That's hard work. Conversion is hard dang work. Anyone who tells you that it's easy to be a Christian is, is not doing it right. It is hard work to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus likened it to taking up a cross daily and following him. He also said, though, that that cross is where you're going to find rest. So it is the best, it is the most challenging aspect of your life to be a disciple of Jesus. It's the most comfortable, like I love what Chris said, you know, it's the most comforting, uncomfortable thing you'll experience. It's, 
everything in God is some sort of paradox in some way, right? But we need to, because it goes on to say, listen to this in John 15, and you must also testify because you've been, been with me from the beginning. And I love this. He says to his apostles, and Jesus is saying this to all of us, you must testify. It's not enough to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's not even enough to say Jesus Christ is my Lord. We need to testify and be proclaiming that truth to anyone who will listen. As God opens the doors for conversations, we need to be able to, we, we need to step in with other people in their lives and say, Jesus Christ is Lord, and this is why I believe in him. We must be ready to testify because right now, do we not know that right now there are like people literally dying to know the love of Jesus Christ in our world? Literally dying to know the love of Jesus. We must be ready to go. God wants to use you as a blessing. I've experienced this in my life so many ways, big and small. Some, some that were planned and well prepared for, others that just caught me off guard. I was taking my wife down to the beach, and we stopped in uh, West Virginia for the night because we got off to a late start. We usually like to just get up in the morning and drive straight through to the beach. You know, it's a long day, but you get there. On this particular day, we couldn't leave in the morning because of some things going on, so we left in the afternoon. We went halfway into, into West Virginia and stopped for the night. And in the morning, I, was, I had my heart set on one thing, right? Everyone has this thing uh, in their heart when they go to a hotel. It's like a waffle, <laughs> a hotel waffle. Everyone loves the hotel waffle. Why? Because we can make it eat it, and not have to clean up the waffle maker. I mean, that's the hardest thing about making a waffle is have to clean up the mess, like mix the dough. No, they just give you a little cup. You just pour the waffles. Cool, I can do that. You know, I mean, I, I usually make a pretty good mess trying to make a hotel waffle, but I don't have to clean it up, so it don't matter. You know, so, so I'm thinking, okay, hotel waffle, this is going to be awesome. So, I, you know, I, I walk into the, uh, the little, what I think is the kitchen area, and there's no waffle maker. There are no cereal. There's nothing. There's nothing but coffee. I'm like, crud. What kind of hotel in the 20th century doesn't have free breakfast? They might as well have no internet. What are, we, what are we, like savages? We're certainly not Amish. Come on, where's my internet? Where's my, where's my waffle? And as I'm feeling this complaining, whining, grumbling spirit kind of stirring up in me, the Lord just says, go talk to the woman there fixing up coffee. And there was a woman who, she worked for the hotel. She was like restocking things and cleaning up the, the coffee bar. And I'm like, are you sure, Lord? He's just like, just go. Because <laughs> there's been many times, I share this story, I want you to know there's many times when the Lord has said go and I haven't gone. I mean, I'm not perfect. I don't respond. I don't bat a thousand. None of us do. But on this particular moment, I said, okay, God, I'll go. So I walked over to her and I just said, hey, good morning. How you doing? And she goes, oh, I'm all right. And I just said to her, you know, because like I knew that there was more, but I didn't know what. So I just said, well, that is about the worst all right in the history of all rights. Are you sure you're okay? And she's like, no. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And she went to explain that her sister had just been taken to the hospital. She had a brain aneurysm. She was in the, the intensive care unit that they weren't sure if she was going to live, that they had a team of doctors down in Charleston, West Virginia, working on her. And like she was all freaked out and, and scared for her sister's life. And then it became very uh, obviously what the next move was. And I just said, well, can I pray for her and pray with you? And she said, yes. And then I said, can I just gently place my hand on your shoulder? And she said, yes. And then I just started praying, Lord Jesus Christ, send forth your Holy Spirit upon Vicki. I'd asked her her name. Her name was Vicki. Lord, bless Vicki. And bless the team of doctors looking after her sister. Just fill Vicki with peace. Fill the doctors with clarity of thought and knowledge and everything that they need to know to, to, to take good care of her sister. Lord, we thank you for that. You're a God of power, a God of blessings. Just be with her. And I went on praying like this for about maybe a minute, minute and a half. And when I was done, she was bawling her eyes out because somebody in her life, in the midst of this rundown little hotel on the side of the road in West Virginia, stopped to invite God to touch her heart. It wasn't me. It was God who was touching her heart. But because of my relationship with God and, my, and, my, and, and how I've grown in what the Lord has done for me, I was able to hear the Spirit say, go pray with her. And she was blessed. I don't know whatever happened, 
Don't know what happened to her sister. Don't know what happened to her. Never saw her again. That's not my job. My job is not to be the Savior. My job is not to change the world. My job is to respond to the Spirit as the Spirit asks me to and do what I can in my own simple little way to bless the world around me. And that's all that God is going to ask of you. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life if we're going to do this well. It doesn't come from us. This is why Jesus says in John 16, it's, I tell you the truth, it's better for you that I go. For if I don't go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world. Are you convicted by God that there's nothing better in this world than Jesus Christ? I mean, I, I think we know it up here, but do you, is it like a thorn in, your, in, your, in the side of your heart, an ache that there's nothing in this world better than Jesus Christ? That the purpose of your life is not to bounce from one thing to the next until you die, but to have a, a, a plan that is exciting and joyful that where God calls you into powerful service and building of his kingdom. Because nobody got left behind in that invitation. We are all called to be that blessing for the world. And, it, you know, and, and, and to echo Mother Teresa who said, we don't have to do great things. We have to do simple things with great love. Great love is the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is why our life in the Spirit, if we are going to do anything that makes any kind of difference in the world, if it's not Spirit-filled, it's not going to change anything, really, not in the long run. How, many, how much money has our government thrown at poverty and trying to make our world a better place with money? And what has it led us to? Nothing but more division and strife and greed and stealing by our politicians and lying by our politicians and then manipulating and playing with us as if, you know, like, hey, every four years they can tell us whatever they want to tell us. And we're just going to line up behind them. And I don't care if you're, you have an R or a D behind your name. They're all a part of, in my mind, part of the same game. Because we keep trying to solve spiritual crisis with political solutions, and it doesn't work. Because only the Holy Spirit can heal. Only the Holy Spirit. And we... Thank you. But we, we've got to be the people who are surrendered to the Holy Spirit. We have got to be the bearers of light, that light of Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to bear the light of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit setting you on fire. And you won't go out and change the world. You won't even change the country, but you might be able to change your community. You might even just be able to change your family. And that's enough. That's enough. Everybody has cells. Let's save the body one cell at a time. Let's not, you know, because if we look at the whole thing and everything, we're going to be so immobilized we won't be able to do anything. Let's look to the Lord and say, Lord, send me your, your spirit. In that, God wants to give us gifts to, to empower us to do this. It says in the catechism, this is Article 801, 802, it says, whether extraordinary or simple and humble, Charisms are graces of the Holy Spirit which directly or indirectly benefit the church, ordered as they are to her building up to the good of man and to the needs of the world. So God wants to give you gifts. Some are extraordinary, some are simple and humble, but God wants to give each one of us gifts that will build up the church, bring goodness into the lives of our fellow man, and meet the needs of the world. 801 and 802. It goes on to say, charisms are to be accepted with gratitude. Not feared. Not shied away from. You know, like, can we all admit, like, we're just not worthy of this and get over ourselves? I mean, like, let's just get over ourselves because if we don't get over ourselves, nothing's going to happen. We are all unworthy, but God has chosen us. And because of that, he has said the word, and we have been healed. We have been called. We have been chosen. We can move forward. We can say yes to this. Charisms are to be accepted with gratitude by the person who receives them and by all, all, all members of the church. They are wonderfully rich grace for the apostolic vitality. Does anybody doubt that we need a lot of apostolic vitality in our church today? I mean, like, it's pretty bad out there. And it's only because we haven't been calling upon the Holy Spirit, right? We've been trying to, like, once again, use human effort 
to heal the mystical body of Christ. We need spiritual grace at work that we're cooperating with to bring about the healing of the church, the renewal of the church. You know, they need to be used in conformity with the mission of the church, with the authentic prompting of the same spirit. So we need to be rooted in prayer as individuals. We need to be praying and asking God to lead us. And we need to be using our gifts at the service of the church. And that could be, for some of you, music. Some of you might have the gift of writing. Some of you, have you ever been in a conversation and the Lord just put on your heart a word to say to somebody that helped make their day better? Sometimes it's a very simple word, just a word of encouragement. Some of you exercising mercy and compassion through corporal works of mercy, feeding the poor. Now, right now, the church needs to see corporal works of mercy. I mean, the world needs to see the church serving the poor. I mean, we, we have a Savior who talked a lot about care for the poor. Yeah. And I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes, but, you know, this is the government's idea. We're going to end poverty. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. I don't want you to end them. I want you to love them. Because as St. Philip Neri said, we're not here to save the poor. The poor are here to save us, to move our hearts to mercy and compassion. So let's let the Spirit lead us to greater works of mercy and compassion, to service, to giving, hospitality, but then, yes, healing and signs and wonders and evangelization and prophecy, powerful signs that God is alive and powerful in our world today. And it all comes about through one simple prayer. It's an ancient prayer. You prayed it just a few weekends ago. Bene Sancte Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit. The three most dangerous words you are ever going to pray in your life. Because when you say, come, Holy Spirit, and you say, now that you're here, I surrender. Anyone ever read The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe? I've got five children. Four of them are in their 20s. One of them's 12. And I, every one of them got read by me the, the, the complete series. How, how, who's read The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe? Aslan is the lion. He's the Christ figure in the story in The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. And uh, little Lucy's asking Mr. Beaver, uh, is, he, is he safe? He sounds so fierce. Is, is the lion safe? And he's, you know, he's like, safe? Oh, no, he's not safe. Not safe at all. But he is good. And that's our God. He's not coming to give us safety or comfort. He's coming to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we will become his children and do great and beautiful things in his name. It's dangerous because if we actually want to live this life, we will be rejected. We will be mocked. We will be ridiculed. You will be hated. How do I know this? Because Jesus said we would. <laughs> I mean, I trust in the words of Jesus when he said, look, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. If they rejected me, they're going to reject you. There's risk in this, but it's well worth the risk. So when we come back, we're going to finish with the close out with a song with John Paul. That'll take us to 3 o'clock. Take a break, stretch your legs, go give me, get something to drink. Come back here at 3.30. Because I'm going to do a sh much shorter message for the second session and we're going to spend the majority of the time praying for the Holy Spirit, praying with one another. And whatever you're coming with from a need, that, you know, it says the Spirit wants to be poured out according to the need of the church. You're bringing that need of the church with you. So maybe take a few minutes as you're coming back to reflect upon what is it that you want from the Holy Spirit? What do you need right now in order to move forward as His disciple? And what is it that you want from the Holy Spirit? Just let the Spirit take you there. So we name the Father, Son, Holy Spirit.